Hello and welcome to Open Door. My guest is Lucky Caswell Harris. She's a holistic practitioner, relaxation strategist, and she is the president, CEO, and the head person in charge of Serenity Solutions. Welcome to Open Door. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you. And uh, again, I always try to be transparent when I start these shows and I was sharing with you before we got started or as we got started that once upon a time I worked for a very prestigious insurance company and I had the fortune of selecting your claim as one of the claims that I was going to reinspect. And who would have known that I would have walked into the house of a poet, a Reiki practitioner, someone who uh, teaches some of the Eastern modalities that we know about, and someone who has designed a game for use for children and grown folks. But before we get to all of that, let's talk about Lucky Caswell Harris. Uh, you are a native queen, I assume? I was raised here. I am not, was not born here. I am a native Cleveland, have all of my educational time has been here in, in Cleveland. Okay, but you started somewhere else. I was born in Alabama. Oh, okay. What what part of Alabama? Montgomery. Montgomery, Alabama. Oh, that's a yes, very, yeah. very significant uh, place to be from. Location of the uh, bus boycott that changed America? Yes, that is so true. Okay. I wonder how far uh, Montgomery is from a, a place called Troy, Alabama. You ever heard of Troy? I'm not familiar with it, no. Okay. Well, if you haven't heard of Troy, then I know you haven't heard of Clopton. Oh, no, I have not. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> Clopton is where my mama and I'm from. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, and I, how far from Montgomery is that? I don't know. That's why I was asking you, but oh. apparently you don't know, and it's okay because I don't okay. know either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but yeah, we we both have Alabama roots of sorts. My mother's side of the family is from uh, Alabama, and my father's side of the family uh, started out in Virginia, Southwest Virginia small okay. town called Galax, but uh, you started out in Alabama, then you somehow migrated to Ohio. That's right. My mother, um, and this is, this is really something, my great niece came um, from Atlanta a week ago um, on a family emergency, and we were talking, and she wanted to know about her ancestors, and I she did a taping of me talking about my growing up in Montgomery, and I mentioned to her as a joke that my mother brought me here to Ohio so that I would not be a tree ornament, and that just intrigued her. And she taped what I was saying because we've been talking about um, the significance of taping our elders um, for them our younger generation to be able to know where they came from and not to lose that history of your heritage. And when I mentioned to her where I came from, her reaction was, oh my, is it now because they're hearing about it more. And so I had that conversation with her as to where my grandmother lived, that I could, what I witnessed as a child before my mother brought me to Ohio. Mm -hmm. So what kinds of things did you witness before your mother brought you to Ohio? We lived um, on a street called West Jeff Davis. I would sit on my grandmother's porch, and I witnessed the fire hydrants being opened on people, the dogs being sick on people, and the, the, that hint made me say to her or had me say to her, if my mother would not have brought me here to Ohio, I would have been a tree ornament for the fact that I was very inquisitive, had, you know, was not aware of what was going on per se, and uh, asking questions and remembering my grandmother and my mother, t you know, taking me in the house. There was a lot of stuff going on, of course, 
uh, back in that day. So those are some of the things that I, I witnessed, you know, and of course we had gone back to Montgomery many times uh, after that. Mm. You know, it's interesting. The first time you said tree ornament, I didn't understand what you meant. Mm-hmm. But now mm-hmm. that you put it within that context, uh, Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit comes to mind. Yes, exactly. Yes. So uh, you mentioned being from Montgomery. Do you have any recollection of the boycott, or was it too too early for you? I came to Ohio between five and a half and six years old. And I remember some parts of things um, that was going on during that time and going back and there were still things happening uh, periodically when we would go back. Okay. That, uh, you know, that witnessing the fire hoses and all that other kind of stuff, uh, for a young person, that had to have been quite traumatic for you. Very much so, you know, because you didn't know what you were witnessing, but you knew that there was turmoil and you knew that things were were going on around you. And, of course, you know, you pick up the vibes from your parents, your elders, and, um, and of course, the disturbance that you would see and hear. So, yeah, it, it does have an effect on you. Yes, absolutely. So age of five and a half, six, you come to Cleveland and then what? Enrolled in school and, um, like I said, periodically going back, always on a train. That was the best memories for us, the Pullman cars on the train uh, with my mother, my uncle, and my aunt. And being able to just, you know, coming from that era, and I'm the youngest of, of, of four girls, for queens, by the way, it was a treat to be able to do things going back, but not in that same time frame. My mother was very cautious about making sure that things that were going on when we went back that we were not involved in or what were not privy to any of that um, as direct as it was previously. Okay. So you mentioned your mother, uh, you, your mother, father, and all four of you were all together, correct? No, my mother, actually my dad was uh, not, my dad had been um, in the military and was killed in the military. Mm. And so my, yeah. And my mother raised us four girls by herself. Well, family, because, you know, at that time it wasn't like by yourself. Right. Because it, oh, yes. So I, I really want to make that clear. The times were so much different in so many ways. Uh, so you can't say, you know, she raised four girls by herself. The village because, raised you. Yes. I was raised definitely by the village. <laughs> yes. So how old were you when your father uh, suffered the mishap? I was very young. I don't even remember my dad. Wow. I remember family members talking about him. I remember his side of the family. Uh, but I don't remember him myself. I, there's pictures, you know. And they don't let you forget. That's another thing. Your your village protects you, but they also don't let you forget where you came from and who you are and whose you are. Okay. So you ended up coming to Cleveland, and uh, this is an international show because we're on WOVU dot org and it's heard around the world. So there are probably folks who will hear this show who don't know, but always curious to know what Cleveland neighborhoods or communities folks grew up in. So what was it for you? I grew up in the Mount Pleasant area. Okay. So you went to like Audubon and... I went to Audubon, Lafayette, Hamilton, John. I started at John Hay in 
my junior year. And I graduated from John Adams. So I'm all in that area of Mount Pleasant. Okay. And then you went to college? I went to Tri-C and David Myers. Okay. And what did you get your degrees in? Business. Business administration. Okay. And so where did that take you? Well, it starting my business, um, I also worked uh, for the state for 31 years. So it took me down that avenue uh, to be able to do things of, of that nature, being an employee of the state, um, and now, of course, my the business that you had mentioned previously. Okay, and what department in the state did you work for? S- several departments. Well, I work for the lottery, Ohio Lottery Commission. Okay. Oh. And... Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I was just thinking her name is Lucky and she works I, for the I was Lottery waiting. Commission. Yeah, I was waiting on that. That's why I hesitated for you yeah. two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that little, I've heard them all. I believe I've heard, yes, I've probably heard them all in the 31 years that I was employed with the Lottery. Mm-hmm. So... Since you opened that door, tell us about how you got the name Lucky. I am named after my father. Oh, okay. My, we had, they had three girls and whatever the name was going to be, it would have been after my dad. My father's name was Luck without the Y. And when I was born... My middle name is Gene, which was his brother's name, but my middle name is spelled with the J instead of the G. And that's how I'm named after my father. Wow, that is absolutely fascinating. I'm, I'm glad we were able to resolve that mystery because I was thinking about <laughs> that moments ago and I thought, well, Dag, I didn't ask her about her name and you cleared that up. So... <laughs> We're grateful to you for that. I think what we're going to do right now is take our first break and dive back into the life of Lucky Caswell Harris when we come back. You're listening to Open Door right here on 95.9 FM WOVU, a Burton Bell Car community radio station. We'll be back in a few minutes. We're back on Open Door with Lucky Caswell Harris, holistic practitioner, relaxation strategist, and the president and CEO of Serenity Solutions. Welcome back to the program. Uh, Before we took the break, we were talking about how you got your name. uh, But before we got to that, you described your history coming from Montgomery, Alabama, and then coming into Cleveland, living in the Mount Harris, uh, Mount Pleasant area of the city and all the various schools that you went to. Uh, You went to Tri-C and David Myers University, and you worked for the Ohio Lottery Commission for 31 years. That is a fascinating history, but on top of all of that, you have this other side, which is the holistic practitioner and the relaxation strategist and and all of that. And I want to dive into that, but first... Let's talk about your experience with the Lottery Commission. Exactly what did you do for the Ohio Lottery? I did a hybrid of things. Um, but my job before I, my position before I retired, I was the uh, philanthropic community service person for the lottery. Meaning that I was more or less a professional fundraiser, I was in charge of our adopt-to-school program throughout the state. The lottery has um, nine regions, and each region would adopt a school in their area, and nine regions throughout the state, I should say. And so I was in charge of that, um, fundraising for, and this is something that a lot of people are not aware of, but the lottery not only was involved in our schools, but very much so in the community in being able to uh, harvest for hunger in each one of our nine 
locations would have a Harvest for Hunger drive. We had the, once again, the adopt-to-school program, uh, tutoring programs, things of that nature. And I was in charge of all of those for all of nine regions. Okay. When we think about the lottery, we associate the lottery as existing for the benefit of the schools, but I'm just wondering how much benefit was provided to the schools. You mentioned adopting a school, but I'm looking at the relationship of the Ohio lottery to the entire school system of the state. Well, the adopt the school program, we had our employees go into a school, um, Our location here in Cleveland is the Region 1 location. And being able to, we had about four schools that we were involved in, and our employees would be able to go in and actually tutor, mentor, uh, meet the needs of whatever the school needed for us to do for them. And that really spread out throughout the states in our nine regions. So we were very much involved in the school system because of course our our funds were allocated for the for the schools okay once upon a time i indirectly worked for the lottery commission no i didn't work for the lottery commission but what i did was i wrote a a radio program called reflections a moment in music history that was sponsored by the ohio lottery and it aired on stations uh, across the state um, it was, um, uh, it was kind of a retrospective on recording artists and groups. And, uh, it was a two minute commercial and I did the, the content on the front end. Like for instance, if we, the subject was the spinners, I would give you some factual in- information about the spinners and then there'd be a 30 second lottery ad. And then, uh, on the other side of it will be a continuation of the story. So, this was while I was working at that insurance company, which was really a blessing to me because it, it allowed me to continue to be involved in broadcasting, even though I kind of got kicked out when I got fired from the last radio job that I had in Cleveland. But anyway, that's a side story. Um, but Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you worked for the Lottery Commission for 31 years, and then you retire and you start living your artist life. Well, I was living the artist's life while I was working for the lottery. Okay. Um, Art has always been a passion of mine in one form or another. So it was a very easy transition for me because I was involved in, you know, things. uh, I always wanted to write, so I was writing and had not published. Um, I like to dibble and dab in, in art different forms of art. So my retirement was just um, another aspect of my being artful. Yes. I I totally relate. I I was really kind of in the same situation and I stopped saying that I retired because what really happened was I left my job and then I pursued my artist life on a full-time basis. So exactly. Yes. Exactly. And are you finding that you're busier now than you were then? Yes. A lot busier. And then you wonder how were you able to do your job, your day job, as some people would say, and find the passion to do what you love to do. But you were able to do that because it was a passion. Mm Mm-hmm. So talk about the, the various uh, lanes that you traveled in, in terms of your, your artist life. I was always, and you know, I, I didn't realize that I was on that path for the holistic part of things, but I was always interested. And that could come back as, as we're talking about this. It really could go back to being around my elders and being in the South, where you could go out in, to the fig tree in my, my grandma's yard on the side of the, the house, or being able to pick greens at your aunt's, you know, with their garden and things. And they used the earth and the natural things uh, to heal. 
So I didn't realize the impact it had made upon me. But I was always in that lane. I just brought in the lane a little bit more uh, into what I'm uh, engaged in now. Interesting. Okay. So um, you also indicated that you wrote a book. It's called From the Wound to Wounded to Wonderful. Tell us about the genesis of that project. Well, it was something, it was, it's, a, it's a book of poetry, and it was something, poems I had been writing for years. I, as far back, as far back as, I believe, probably elementary school, definitely junior high. And I would keep these, these poems. And as I decided to write the book, I went back and looked at some of the points. I put some in in the book. I had others that I had been working on throughout the years. So there wasn't a lot that I had to come up with as far as, as compiling things to put in the book. And I that's really the genesis of the name of the book, you know, that you're from the womb and as a as a a woman of color, there's so many aspects that we play that we are in our lives and other people's lives, and that's where some of the wounding comes from. And the wonderful is because I am a woman of color, and it just migrates right onto where I am right now. Mm-hmm. When you describe the wounded aspect of of this concept, what what uh, encapsulates it? What what would you attribute the wounds to, uh, aside from the experience of being a black woman? Or is that it? That's enough. And we still see that to this day, do we not? Yes. There, there you know, there's nothing that I would, you know, that in itself would be enough for me. It is enough for me. Yes. Well, you know, when, when, when I think about it as, as we have this conversation, I just think about the, the epigenetic damage that we carry from generation to generation. So it's, it's, it's that woundedness that is a part of who we are, you know, but I think the real blessing uh, is to go from that wounded mentality or that wounded or that understanding of being wounded to a place where you could say that you're now wonderful. I agree. My take on that is we all grow through something. And the key word is growing because you can't stay there. So we all grow through something, but it's how we come out of it. You know, and the, the cover of my book is a, is a caterpillar and it's the butterfly evolving from that caterpillar. That's the, the cover of the book. And that's the wonderful part that you don't stay there. We grow through something because it's a growing experience to be able to come from that caterpillar stage into that beautiful butterfly. And that's where your wonderful comes in. Mm -hmm. You know, in a in a broader sense, uh, when you look at the the change that the world is going through right now, there are some who might describe this restructuring, this this pivot point that we're in, this this transitional place that we're in right now, as the same phenomenon. I agree. That's why I said, you know, that wounded. You have a, we've evolved, but how much have we evolved, really? Are the basic things that put us in that wounded position, are they still there? And how are we handling it to come out of it? You know, mm-hmm. something happens to all of us. Like I said, we, we grow through so many things, but it's the results and what we learn in that process. It's the lessons that you learn. Yes. And the one other thing that I want to express before we move forward is really the significance of the womb. 
because I think that there are a lot of folks out there, or I'll, I'll just say many, that really don't understand the sacred aspect of the womb. They don't take the sacred aspect of their womb as seriously as they should, and then they experience complications later in their lives because they didn't. There's so much that, and a lot of people are not, a, may not, and I don't like to say a lot, but there are some people that don't realize the significance of the womb, as you had said. And there's so many times that you hear how people are are birthing, you know, um, and you wonder why did you birth your child in in a bathtub? Um, why did you have a C-section? You know, things of that nature. And then there's cultures that teach their children while they're in the womb. And there are people, yeah, and there there are people that have said, um, a baby comes out um, of the mother's womb, and it really does have an effect on that child and how that baby comes out. And then I've had an elder say the baby comes out, and the first thing you do is you smack it. To awaken it and what a terrible way to awaken you from a very secure place in the womb and you come out and you're already in a strange land and then you're getting smacked yes yep and it's also said that when the, the baby is transversing the birth canal that they receive instructions that affect them for the rest of their lives very exactly. interesting very interesting conversation. Uh, we're going to have to take a break, but we will come back. You're listening to Open Door on 95.9 FM WOVU. My guest is Lucky Caswell Harris. She's a holistic practitioner and relaxation strategist. We'll be back with more Open Door right after this. Welcome back to Open Door. Vince Robinson with Lucky Caswell Harris, holistic practitioner, relaxation strategist. Before we took the break, we were talking about what happens during the birthing process and how infants actually receive instructions as they go through that process. Uh, You also talked about um, mothers that uh, basically teach their infants while they are in the womb, and, and I can attest to that because... My mother did that with me, and as a result, or perhaps as a result, uh, by the age of three, I was uh, reading, and by the age of five, I was doing addition, subtraction, and some lightweight multiplication, So, uh, and I, I was breastfed as well, so they, they say that that's a plus. Um, I think this is a really important uh, subject, too, because uh, as you know or may not know, Cleveland leads the nation in infant mortality. So uh, we need to do all that we can to ensure the safe entry into the world for those ancestors who are returning through the children that are being born today. And I agree with that. We are, unfortunately, that's really um a bad place to be in for our city, for Ohio, not just Cleveland, to be in, to say that that's a title that we have when there's so much that we have to offer. Mm -hmm. And then from that stage of our children being at that point, our babies being at that point, and then the life that they're coming into and living in an area or areas of uh, disadvantage. So where does it stop? Or does it stop? And when does it stop? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That. Mm-hmm. And in terms of disadvantage, you know, uh, now that you mention it, <laughs> we look at the history of this country. We look at the idea that the playing field has never been level. And now we're at this point in our nation's history that everyone is becoming so aware of the racial di- divide, the, 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 the need to address the dynamic, and they're giving a lot of lip service to it. you know. But in terms of widespread sweeping change, 
Uh, it's so incremental, you know, looking at the life of a man who is 104 years old and all he has known is a struggle for rights. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, 100 years and you're still asking for the same thing. Yes. That's why I said, when does it stop? Does it stop? And, you know, each, uh, I, it may not even be a decade, but each decade or so, we're labeling it something else. And there's a word that I really don't care to use, but you hear it more and more now, and it's the underserved. It used to be the disadvantaged. You know, it's a play on words. It's the semantics of what they want to title it, but it's all the same. So if you can label it, why can't you address it when you can label it and you supposedly you know what it is because you're labeling it? Yeah, that that. And the other thing is that it implies a position of control. It's it, it implies a position of, you know, an ability to determine that someone could possibly be served, you know, but the fact that you're saying that they're un- underserved means to a certain extent, and I'm just, you know, this is just what's floating through my head right now, but it's like you, you can make a decision as to whether or not you will serve. And then, exactly. and then you ask the question, well, why have these folks gone underserved? Exactly. Yeah. You can label it, but you won't address it. You know, labeling it means that you are aware of it. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So then the question becomes, for us at least, what do we do about it? Because it seems like, as I was using the the example of the 104-year-old man, you know, we keep putting ourselves in a position to ask. You know, I'm mindful of the fact that the right for black people in this country to vote is something that has to be renewed every so often. I don't know what the year is, but you know, our ability to vote is going to come up for a vote and the house of representatives in the Senate or the legislature for this country is going to have to come together and say, okay, well let's, you know, let's push this through. But why is it that we're in that position? Why is it that, you know, we're making a case for reparations, those of us who are, are floating around in, in that lane, you know, why is it that, you know, we have to convince a country that has profited on our labor and not just our from, labor because, yes, you know, from we are, our lives. Yeah, we from are, our lives. Yeah. They have profited right. from what we have built. Mm-hmm. But we, we have to continue to fight what is for what is ours we build it but we are not rightfully as you said it has to be voted on ever so often for us to get our own rights that we built and we provided for others yes because we're underserved or disadvantaged or whatever title they want to put on it at that particular time in society. Yeah. It, it's, it's coded language, you know? Uh, yeah, it is. That's, that's, that's what it is. But um, what I like to do is kind of shift gears because we've gotten into the what's wrong, <laughs> but we've, we've also talked about the fact that, you know, healing is something that is extremely important. And you are one of those people who are affecting others by creating conditions through which they can heal. So let's talk about your background in uh, holistic uh, practicing, if I can use that term. Uh, I think you said that you also teach Tai Chi. Uh, and, and so you're connected with things like that in meditation and meditation and so-called Eastern modalities that are being integrated into uh, medicine that's being practiced in the United States. Uh, so you said that you were taking trips to Alabama and you were seeing how your grandmother and, and folks 
uh, uh, of her era were going and they were using herbs and plants and, and whatnot. So uh, would you describe that as the beginning of your uh, affinity to holistic healing? At the time that I started, um, I didn't even realize that this is where I was, you know, at, at that juncture. I, when I did decide that this is the path that I was going to take, it was already decided for me because that's where the lane I was in, basically. Um, I've always been very intrigued by uh, healing. I'm not one that likes to take a lot of medication. Um, I read up on things that you can do that are natural for the body and the mind and the spirit. So hence that as I realized what I would evolve into, it had already started. It just evolved into my being a relaxation strategist. Everything that I do, primarily everything that I do, is related to being relaxed, and it's on a natural level, no no uh, drugs or stimulants other than your mind and your body being able to heal itself uh, to some extent. Not saying that you don't need a medication for what may ail you, but that with certain care that you take of yourself, your mind, and your body, you're able to um, control some things. Stress, in particularly, is the underlying cause of so many of our ailments, our sickness, our dis-ease. Dis-ease brings about disease. If you're stressed for so long, it brings about different chemical changes in your body. Um, your mind is going to think a certain way. If you're healthy, then you're on a different path as though uh, the body will heal itself in some circumstances. But we have to be aware of where we are. You know, the the mind will control the body because you're thinking. How are you thinking and what are you doing? What are you putting into your body? And there's so many aspects of that. And um, I teach meditation. I'm um, certified by Deepak Chopra uh, in his form of meditation, which is uh, primordial sound meditation. And primordial sound is the earliest sound that we hear, it's the purest sound of the earth to be able to uh, listen for or to be able to meditate on. And other forms of meditation, there are a migrant of, of forms of meditation. Um, and of course, the Tai Chi, as you said, the Eastern form of, uh, they call that. Um, walking meditation, parts of Tai Chi, that different forms of Tai Chi that you do. It's relaxing the body and the mind. And these are things that really keep us balanced to go into. Uh, the Reiki is, is life force energy. Your Chi is life force energy. We, anything that's living has Chi. And these are things that... Um, when we become more aware of who we are and how we are put together, making it very plain how we're put together and the different levels that we are at and we go through throughout life, we grow through. Um, pay more attention to who you are, basically. What's your makeup? And what do you need? You know, know who you are. Know thyself. And, and be able to do what you need to do for yourself. Right. So you've uh, given us at least three things that we can work on, and I want to take a deeper dive into those, uh, but we're up against another break. <laughs> so, uh, but specifically, I want to talk to you about how uh, the organs 
are the seat of various emotions because there is connectedness between the mind and the body and the body including those organs. So let's talk a bit more about how your your uh, organs are related to your emotions when we come back. You're listening to Open Door on 95.9 FM WOVU. We're rounding third and headed home. Final segment, Open Door, with our guest, Lucky Caswell Harris, the uh, holistic practitioner and the relaxation strategist. Uh, Before we took the break, you were talking to us about Reiki, and I definitely want to understand how that works. But before we spoke about Reiki, we were just talking about that mind-body connection, and um, I have a specific interest in how the uh, organs in your body are the seat of specific emotions and, and how disease manifests when those organs aren't functioning properly. Can you give us some insight on the organs and, and what, uh, what uh, emotions they're related to and how we can promote healing in our organs? Well, as you know, it's, it's, we're all, we're all unit. So if you are not Whole, and, and I won't even get into the chakras um, so much so as being able to know that if you are, if one part of the whole is, is not working, everything is not working as it should. So you're, I have a book that, um, and I don't recommend anything, but there's a book that I've read that is called Your Body Speaks Your Mind. And it's a book that just says, and it's by Deb Shapiro, and it basically basically says, if you have um, a backache, how do you relate this? And you've done everything that you know to do um, for this backache. Is it a physical or mental situation? And I mean mental by... um, is it something that is bothering you? The way that um, it's stated in this book is, who's on your back, basically? Why is your back hurting so much? Why is there such discomfort? Um, you have a headache. Why do you continue to have these headaches? Uh, is there something on your mind that you won't face or acknowledge? And it's, it's, you know, and that's breaking it down without being very, um, very clinical. Because when I speak with my clients, and I'm not by any mean, I, I don't um, prescribe anything. We just talk about the natural things to them. I am not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I'm a holistic practitioner. And it helps the people that you're that I'm um, working with be able to look at and hopefully find what they need within themselves without me putting it out there and saying, well, I think you need this because that's really not um, what I do. I strategize with them to find what they need. And the reason that I talk about this book, because it brings it right down to something as simple as, your back hurting, and yes, there may be an underlying physical reason. And I know of people that have gone to the doctor for physical ailments, and they have found nothing. But then when they look at themselves uh, on a holistic end of it, it could be an underlying situation in their life that is causing that and not um, that you fell and hurt your back type of thing. And that's why it's a little bit easier to bring it to people on, for me at that level to be able to say, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not here. I don't prescribe any medication or anything, but on a holistic level, it could be something if one thing is out of sync within you, 
you're not whole. And that's what the holistic principles are. It's holistic. It's the whole of the person to be able to function where you are comfortable, uh, manageable. You know, if you have something on your mind and you're worrying about something, um, particularly this plague upon the land, has brought about so much stress with at so many levels that people are finding that they are um, experiencing things that they had not, and, and body-wise, physically, that they had not experienced before. And that's not discounting the actual plague that they have suffered, physical plague, the sickness, the, the COVID-19, but other um, symptoms of things because of what they're experiencing externally. Well, I'm, I'm kind of glad that you brought that up because, you know, again, and I'm not a holistic, holistic practitioner, even though I, I talk about a lot of things that relate to holistic practices. Uh, I have been uh, instructed that the kidney or the kidneys are the seat of the emotion fear. And when I look at what has happened in the past year, I can see how fear is one of the things that is driving reaction and action. So because of the fear that has been so prominently and so well executed, not only here in America, but around the world, you know, I I would have to imagine that it is responsible for a lot of the energetic imbalances that are existing in people today. Uh, I also consider the fact that, you know, we as African-Americans or black people or whatever label you want to put on us in this country have had to deal with fear uh, since day one. You know, it was fear of what Massa would do if we didn't pick enough cotton in one day or that Massa might take our children away from us or separate us from a loved one. You know, now one of our our, our, our uh, biggest fears is what happens when you're stopped by a police officer or if you uh, have a mental breakdown and they call the police, you know, and you uh, go to the station and you don't ever come back. You know, so we we are, are given reasons to have fear. And then on top of that, we get the the snuff phenomenon that is, you know, we're scrolling on Facebook all day, every day. And we have to scroll past these videos and watch videos of black folks being traumatized, you know, in various uh, ways as well. So, you know, uh, this seems as though it, it is the perfect prescription for dysfunction, living in constant fear, and then on top of that, carrying the trauma, the collective trauma of all of those who came before us. And it is it is something that we carry, whether we admit it or perhaps we don't even know it, that we're carrying. You know, they'll say, um, you, you have diabetes, and, you know, the old old folks, as they call them, the say you got sugar. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's hereditary, you know. Um, and when you, you go to our doctors, they will have this whole list of things. And does your family have this and does your family have that? You know, heart disease. They don't call it sugar. Do you have diabetes? And now it's, you know, pre-diabetes and diabetes one. And, you know, now they're labeling it and putting it in categories as it, it continues to, to, to ravish the body. But there's also this in our heads that, okay, my, my grandmother had sugar. So, yeah, it's in my family, so I will probably get it, but it doesn't have to be. My grandmother was in well into her 90s. We're not even sure how old she was. And I can never remember her going to a doctor, in the, even in the years that I was here in Ohio. And my grandmother went to the doctor and was admitted to the hospital 
And that was the first time uh, one of my cousins or someone said that we can't remember her ever going. And she came home. And to this day, I wonder what, you know, what happened. And I don't mean that there was anything um, adverse. I mean, her, it could have been age for all I know um, with her demise, her, her making her transition. But I do know that she used all kinds of home remedies, you know, um, telling my, my sisters, you know, if you, if you have cellulite and they, of course, she didn't even know anything about that, but you know, you take a grapefruit or a lemon and you rub it on that fat, those ripples on your thighs and that kind of stuff. And, um, old home remedies of taking a lemon and for us, for us girls of color, us chocolate children, you know, if your knees are, are, uh, as they used to say, rusty looking, you take that lemon, cut it in half and squeeze the juice out of it. And you rub that lemon on your elbows because they're, uh, and do you know the word for what they would use? I don't know. Ashy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you never heard, you oh, know, yeah. oh yeah. Yeah, your elbows are ashy, so you need to put, you know, put this lemon, that lemon peel, put your elbow and rub it, or your knees are ashy. And these were the home remedies, and it worked, you know, because what it was doing, it was taking basically the, in, you know, now they have words for it, you know, you shed your skin ever so often, and basically what it was doing, and our knees were ashy because you stayed on your knees, cleaning somebody's house, by the way, Mm -hmm. but that's a whole, (laughs) that's a whole nother story. But these are the things when we talk about uh, the organs of the body and how they change you, it's not just what you are, it's what your ancestors were and carried over. And you're right, from the kidneys to the heart disease, to the high blood pressure, to the sugar, and they just actually have titles for them, different titles now. I don't think my grandmother, I'm almost sure she never even heard of diabetes. Yes. You know, it was, it was sugar. Uh, heart disease, that it, it may have been something else. Um, you know, what we have, because we've evolved so, or we think we have. Yes. We just, we just name it something else. Like I said, you know, underserved disadvantage, however you, whatever era we in now, you know, we went from how many names have we been? Right. Okay. Right. That, that how many names, you know, we've been black and colored and, um, Negro. African American Negro. We've been, you know, and these, these all evolve. Yeah. Now, you know? now it's BIPOC, you know, it's just yeah, so. all, all these things, but everything, but who we really are. Who we really are, and that's the same as as with our health. You know, sugar is now diabetes, and and they go from pre to type two. Might be even more than that. Um, these are the things with that we're dealing with that causes a lot of the stress in our lives. Yes, you know, and we are at at such. When I tell people what I do. I was um, on a Zoom call earlier today, and um, the person said, well, Lucky, what do you do? And I says, I'm a relaxation strategist. Oh, I really need, you know, I really need to talk to you. And I hear that all the time. So we're stressed to the max at this point for whatever reason, and there are so many reasons that we would be. And that's where meditation comes in at. That's where being um, the mindfulness comes in to be able to not internalize so much. Some of us don't have the luxury of being able to take some time away Mm -hmm. and meditate. Well, speaking of luxury, 
we have lost the luxury of time because our show is about to come to a close and there's so much more that I could unpack. I wanted to talk to you about Reiki and how that works and get into meditation a bit more. And I wanted to talk to you about grandma's games and we didn't get to that. So we're going to have to do another show. Perhaps we'll do a segment or two. Uh, so I can have you back and you talk about that because there's definitely something about that that needs to be known by the public. But in the meantime, I want to thank you for being my guest on Open Door. And thank you for having me. I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation. All right. And thank you for listening. Know yourself. Love yourself. Be yourself. Make today a great day. Peace and blessings. Mm-hmm.